Hi, everybody. Welcome to this new episode of Sage Makeup Fridays. If you've been following us so far, you'll notice I'm on my own today. And there's a really good reason for that. Uh, my dear friend Sego just had a baby. And so she's pretty busy at the moment. And she's got better things to do than worry about machine learning. So congratulations, Sego. And thanks again so much for all the help uh, you've, been, uh, you've been providing. Uh, with Sage Makeup Friday. So I'll do my best, right? And uh, and let's see how this works. <laughs> so um, this is episode 11. Uh, we're uh, still working on uh, AutoML, right? And um, in the last couple of weeks, we've studied SageMaker Autopilot, and, and we also looked at uh, an open source library called AutoGluon. And today we will actually spend the whole episode working with AutoGluon on a computer vision um, problem, right? So uh, AutoML for computer vision, let's see uh, what this is all about. And, uh, and we'll actually reuse the example um, that we've been using uh, already a few times this season, uh, where we start from a computer vision data set for uh, cancer cell detection, metastasis detection. And we'll try to automatically build a model with AutoGluon. And well, I'm sure we'll learn a few things. Uh, next week, we'll keep working with AutoGluon on um, a multimodal problem. So we'll work on a data set that includes images, uh, natural language, uh, and categorical features, etc., etc. So make sure to catch that one too. Okay. All right. Um, before we jump into the example, uh, this is where you will find the code for those uh, last few episodes, okay? And go grab it, run it, and uh, ping me if you have any questions, okay? Um, in case you missed the last few episodes, just a quick word about AutoGluon. So AutoGluon is an open source project. Of course, you can find uh, code and examples and documentation on, on GitHub. There's also a really, really cool research paper um, which is actually quite readable, as I've said a few times. So I actually encourage you to spend some time and read it. It gives you a really good overview of what AutoML is and some of the unique features that uh, AutoGluon brings. Um, it's called AutoGluon because it's based on the Gluon API, which is um, uh, part of Apache MXNet. Okay, so don't worry, you don't need to know any MXNet, honestly. Uh, you can just use AutoGluon as is. Okay, but just so you know, this is based on uh, Apache MXNet, the Gluon API, and, and some of uh, some other toolkits like uh, the Gluon CV for computer vision and Gluon NLP, which I'll mention later, uh, later today. Okay, and the main features of AutoGluon is you can build uh, models automatically for uh, tabular data, um, text, images, and as I've said earlier, uh, multimodal data, so uh, data sets that actually include a combination of those. Okay, and let's keep that topic for next week. Um, it, of course, does um, data processing, feature engineering uh, automatically. It includes a very nice selection of algos. Uh, so well-known algos like linear regression, KNN, um, a whole bunch of tree-based algorithms, XJBoost, uh, LightGBM, etc., and also deep learning. So that means um, neural networks for uh, tabular data, uh, which, uh, which go beyond the traditional uh, feed-forward architectures. Um, there, there are some clever tricks in there, uh, which you'll find in, in the research paper. And of course, we also have um, uh, NLP models and computer vision models. Okay, um, it automatically builds uh, ensembling uh, models, uh, uses bagging and stacking, a uh, bunch of techniques which we discussed previously. And more than anything, you know, it really just takes a couple of lines of code, right? And well, by now you know I'm lazy, so that's definitely got to be a good thing, right? Just a few lines, very very little code, you can just fire it up. And, and wait for your model to be trained and uh, do something useful in between, right? Okay, so end of slides for now. Let's, uh, let's close this thing. And let's get started with, uh, with our problem today. Okay, so uh, let me quickly show you some of the images we, we want to work with and, uh, and then I'll backtrack a bit. So 
the problem we're trying to solve today is we have uh, medical images, okay, um, which show uh, cells, right? Some of those cells are healthy. Some of those cells, unfortunately, show uh, metastasis. And, uh, well, that's not a good sign, okay? So it's a binary classification problem, okay? Um, we have um, two classes, uh, I guess, you know, no metastasis images and metastasis images, okay? So we're trying to automatically build a model that uh, can uh, accurately detect um, those images and, and classify them. OK, so where do those images come from? They, they actually come from um, a data set, uh, which is called a Chameleon 16. Um, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of data set and challenges on that website. So here we're using um, a data set that contains 40,000 images. OK, and they're quite tiny, 96 by 96 pixels. OK, and like I said, we only have two classes. Um, so the data set is actually you can see that file here the data set is actually stored in a, an hdf5 file okay um, so pretty dense pretty convenient format but here we like to have uh, the individual images so i have to uh, kind of reverse engineer that file a little bit which is probably not what you would do in real life in real life you would have all those images ready and you could uh, you could train uh, on them directly but here um, I had to write uh, a few lines of silly Python code just to extract those images. Okay, and of course this will be included in the in the GitHub repository. So very simple, uh, creating some folders, um, one per class. Okay, because that's that's the format that um, Autogluon will expect. Okay, so dataset slash no metastasis, dataset slash metastasis, and then I'm just opening the file. Okay, and that file contains um, uh, two, uh, two parts, obviously, uh, the images and the labels, right? And let's not worry too much about the internals of uh, HDF5 uh, files for now. Uh, and the only thing, and of course, it contains those 40,000 images and labels. And so, of course, the only thing I'm doing here is I'm just looping over the, the images, checking the label. So if the label is zero, then um, the image is stored in the no metastasis folder. And if it's one, then of course it's stored in the metastasis folder. Okay, so pretty, pretty straightforward. And well, in the end, um, this is what I get, right? So exactly what you would expect. So uh, two folders and lots of images in each one of them. Again, the only reason I, why I'm doing this is because I need to extract those images from this uh, packed file. Uh, if you have existing images, just, you know, prepare them that way, one folder per class, and you're good to go. Okay. All right. So now let's actually start with the problem at hand. So I'm using SageMaker Studio. Um, I'm using um, an MXNet kernel uh, optimized for GPU. Uh, which is running on a GPU power instance, okay? Um, the reason why I'm doing this, of course, is compared to previous examples, is that uh, I'm going to be training a computer vision model and, well, GPUs will, uh, <laughs> well, G the single GPU here will help with that, okay? Uh, I'm actually using um, a G4DN XL um, instance, as we can see here. Uh, which is uh, which is quite cost effective. You, you could use the bigger um, P3 uh, instances, which have you know uh, up to eight GPUs, and of course that would speed up your training jobs. But you know for cost reasons and just TMO reasons, uh, that G4DN uh, instance is just fine. Okay. All right, uh, so I'm installing AutoGluon uh, and some uh, some widgets for progress indicators. Um, nothing really weird here. Uh, I'm gonna need some objects. Uh, I'm actually only gonna need these, uh, the image dataset object and the image predictor object. And I'm sure you can guess <laughs> what these will, use, uh, will be used for. Um, these are uh, additional objects if I want to set uh, hyperparameters for uh, hyperparameters optimization. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? 
Okay, so just checking that I've got my data set ready. Um, so it's it's almost balanced, right? Which is a good thing. I've got almost as many um, um, Im images with metastasis than no metastasis. So pretty good. 40,000 images is, is uh, a decent number for, for that type of problem. So let's see uh, what we can do, right? Okay, so it's really simple to, uh, to actually uh, load that data. You can just use that image data set object um, and point it at the folder that, um, that you created. And that's it. So, right, so very, very simple. And then we see the, uh, uh, we see, uh, the, the first few examples here. We see the, the path to the first few images, right? Uh, I can check that the data set has the right shape. Okay, uh, so um, yeah, 14,000 samples, two classes, looks good. Uh, so I'm going to be training here on, on the full data set, um, but you could split it, right? Uh, I, I commented this code just uh, out, but this is how you would do it, right? Uh, if you wanted it for uh, to, to, to split on, on training and validation or, or just generally train on a subset of the initial data set, you can use this random split function with uh, with the split uh, factor, right? So this would create two data sets, um, tr the train data set with 90%, the validation data set with 10%, okay? But here we'll just pass everything to autogluon because automatically it will split the data internally for um, for training, validation, and, and bagging, et cetera, if you, if you configure it, okay? Right. So we saw uh, those images already, and now we can actually configure our predictor. So just use that image predictor object, okay? And of course, it has a bunch of parameters, and, uh, and you can find them in the autogluon documentation here. Um, but, you know, for now, we'll just stick to defaults until we know better, okay? And we simply call fit. Uh, so we pass the, the data set. Um, we can pass some parameters. So here I'm just restricting training to five epochs. Okay, we're, we're using transfer learning. Those models have been pre-trained. So yeah, you could train maybe for 10 epochs, but there are probably, there's probably no reason to train for 100 epochs. Okay. And yeah, I'm just making sure uh, we use uh, a single GPU per trial. Um, this is actually useful if you have a, a multi-GPU instance and uh, and you know you wanna you wanna set the number of GPUs that's used for each job. Here, um, I, I'm I only have one GPU anyway, so probably not necessary, but you know it doesn't hurt. Okay, um, one parameter you may want to set is that time limit uh, parameter, uh, which I think I've set uh, in previous examples. Um, so you could set epochs or you could set time limit. Um, so here it will automatically stop at two hours, although I think five epochs are much, much actually shorter than, than that, okay? But yeah, time limit just, just for, I guess, cost and, and, and just conveniency, right? You, you want to make sure those things don't run for, for days and, and just do crazy things, okay? All right, and then we see lots of stuff in the logs. Um, so we see labels. So labels are uh, set to zero and one. Uh, obviously, we only have two labels, so that's good. Okay. Uh, we can see data is randomly split. Uh, so, yeah, no need to do that yourself. Uh, here, uh, hyperparameter op optimization is not set. Okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later. And then we really see all the, all the default parameters that um, autogluon uses. Okay. And again, all of these are uh, configurable. You know, batch batch size. Uh, you can uh, you could change if you wanted uh, learning rate. You could change if you wanted patience, uh, epochs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So here, batch size is set to sixteen. Learning rate is 0 0.01. Epochs is five, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you could you could ask yourself, okay, which model are we actually using here, right? What are what are we doing here? So here we're actually using a, a default model, which is ResNet fifty. Uh, ResNet 50 V1B, um, which is a good all-round uh, model for classification and you know, training times are reasonable. 
but there are many many more uh, you could try actually if you, let me go all the way down um, and you can see the list of models uh, this way right and I did not count them, but there's quite a bit, right? So uh, all the ResNets, you know, VGG, DenseNet, SqueezeNet, MobileNet, Cypher, ResNet. Uh, yeah, so ResNet tra train on Cypher, I reckon. Uh, more ResNet, ResNext. Ah, let's see, you know, well, quite a bit, right? And, and so where do these come from? Um, they're actually part of uh, Gluon CV. And uh, so Gluon CV is a computer vision toolkit that was built um, a couple of years ago now. And uh, again, implemented with the Gluon API on top of MXNet. And it has a, a, a pretty nice model zoo. Let me click on this. Okay. And so, for example, if we look at classification models, uh, yeah, we can see um, how to work with those models. And we can, we can see those actual models that we saw. So let's say we wanted to know more about this model. So we could just go and, and look for it here, right? And sure enough, yeah, it is in the Gluon CV list. Okay, so we see the state-of-the-art uh, top one and top five um, uh, stats, right, accuracies. Um, we can see the training log. Okay, so how was this trained? Okay, what's that? pre-trained model about and you can see it's been uh, it's really tiny here you can see it's been trained on ImageNet and you can see exactly how it was trained right um, and so that's that's a good starting point right so you can you can actually use uh, let me go back to the list uh, you can actually use all those models okay and, and you can see how they were trained and you can see you know, how, how well they're they're, they're doing right and of course, it's always the balance between training time and, and accuracy, right? So ResNet 18 is not as good, of course, as, uh, as uh, ResNet 50, but it trains faster. It's a smaller model. Uh, chances are it will predict faster, etc., etc. Okay, so you can see all those things, right? Uh, and, and go and select, you know, whatever model fits uh, your uh, your actual problem. Do you want top accuracy? Do you want small models? You know, go go and check that out. Right. Okay. So you got you got this whole list, but um, by default uh, you're using ResNet 50, and you can actually select different models um, uh, with the with a model hyperparameter. Uh, we'll, we'll see this um, in a minute. Okay. So easy to easy to use different models. Uh, and, and you can actually pass a list of models that uh, auto glue on should try. Okay, so here uh, we're going to be training with a single model architecture, but you know, again, you could pass you know five models and let it run for you know a few hours or a couple of days, and then uh, it would go and try all those different models. And um, and if you add you know hyperparameter optimization on top, yeah, then you know it becomes uh, a pretty powerful job, right? But it will train for a while. Make sure you have those GPUs. Okay, um, what else can we see here? Uh, well, I think that's it, right? Uh, and and then it starts training, okay? And well, we see the training log speed. We see batch accuracy. We see learning rate uh, here. And you know, I'm always amazed that after one epoch, which is really uh, to a little more than two minutes of training, we all we already get 73, almost 74% accuracy. You know, deep learning is really, really powerful. Okay. Uh, and validation accuracy is actually 84%, even better, right? So just one epoch and you get 84% accuracy. So, you know, that's why you really, you know, you really need to consider transfer learning if you are not uh, using it today. Uh, training from scratch is pretty difficult. Um, we have probably have enough data to train from scratch here, but you would need to train for, I don't know, you know, 50, 100 epochs, maybe more, right? One epoch here and you get, you get good results. Okay. So models are checkpointed. Of course, uh, we only, uh, we're only interested in the best one after one epoch, uh, 
we see well, validation actually went down a little bit. Okay, and then uh, it goes up again at epoch 287%. Okay, so we save that. Uh, goes down again at epoch 3. And epoch 4, we actually hit 89.5. So we almost hit 90%. Um, which which is really nice, right? Because we only train for, uh, how much is that? 10, 12 minutes, something like that. Yeah, 12 minutes. Um, and we get almost 90% accuracy and, and we use default settings, right? Um, and so for those of you out there who really, you know, who really don't know much, about machine learning, who don't know much about deep learning, who are intimidated, maybe, uh, like I was initially. Um, I think this is a really, really cool way to get started, right? Because what did we actually do, right? We put some images in a folder and and we really wrote this, right? Remember I told you uh, Autogluon is, has very little code. Well, there you go. Uh, you know, it's hardly code, right? Um, pass the data set, maybe pass parameters, and that's it. And that's the only thing you write. And you end up with uh, with 90% accuracy, okay? Um, so if you start tweaking, if you start uh, adding different models to the mix, if you start um, running hyperparameter optimization, uh, well, you know, it, it will go up, right? And it, it's never going to be uh, much more complicated than that. Okay, so, and, and these are small images, right? They're really, there's not so much information to learn from. So, um, you know, I'm thinking if you had slightly bigger images and, you know, I guess, uh, it, you know, 96 by 96 is, is really small. So if you had a little, you know, maybe 256 by 256 images, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, accuracy would go up because the, the model and, and the, the algorithm would be able to pick up just more detail in there, okay? So that's a very, very encouraging start, I think. Okay. All right. So now we see uh, we see the configuration. Uh, we see the best accuracy, right? Uh, we can get a uh, summary of, of this job with a little more information. Okay. And then, uh, well, you, you, could, you could predict. I actually didn't add it here. Let me show you how you would do this. Um, it's, it's a one-liner. Okay, uh, so let's let's see how we do this, right? Yep, uh, that's it. <laughs> you take an image and you just predict with it. That's it. It's as simple as that, and uh, there's really uh, you know, there's really nothing else to worry about. Okay, so you could predict right there, um, right? Pretty cool. Okay, so how do we do better? How do we keep improving this accuracy? Um, so of course you could always, like I said, you could always go and uh, and try, um, you know, larger or or more sophisticated models, right? If you go into you know the ResNext uh, architecture, you're certainly gonna do a little better than the default ResNet, or you could go with deeper networks. Okay, you you can go and and uh, experiment with that. Um, another way, of course, is to run hyperparameter optimization. Which, uh, which I think we've shown previously, but it's so simple. You know, let's take a look again. Um, so again, start from a predictor, uh, pass the data set, and um, we can work with presets, okay? And so we can, uh, we'll find in, in the documentation uh, what, those, uh, what those presets are. Actually, let's try and find them, right? Um, they're gotta be here. Okay, predictor, image predictor. And if we look for presets, okay, yes. All right, let's zoom in a bit. Okay, so default is medium quality, faster train, which you know makes sense for quick experiments. Um, and, and there are other options. Uh, you know, you can try best quality, uh, which will train for a little, little longer right it's gonna try more things it's gonna bag it's gonna it's gonna stack it's gonna explore more okay um, and you have you have other settings right high quality fast inference uh, optimized for deployment etc etc okay 
So you can try those settings. Uh, you can actually see uh, if you if you go in the in the GitHub repo and if you look at the actual configs there, uh, you'll see exactly what those are, uh, right? Uh, or you can you can print out uh, hyperparameters, of course, in, in your notebook. So here I'm going with best quality. I'm setting a time limit at four hours, right? Why not? And I'm saying, hey, yeah, I'll stick with, uh, I'll stick to five epochs. And um, this time I want to try, um, you know, ResNet 101 v1, for example. Okay. Um, and, you know, again, you could pass a list of models and it would go and try those. But, you know, the more, the more you add, the more time you need to uh, allocate to the training job because you know, it just tries different things. Okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, it'll say, well, you know, I'm out of time. Sorry. <laughs> couldn't run all those uh, all those experiments okay and so when we run this one uh, we see that um you know we see that the presets have been applied and we see that that model has been applied okay and it's actually downloading it right so uh, no surprises it's it's actually downloading from the the model cv gluanzu uh it's actually downloading from the, the Gluon CV model zoo, uh, and you'll find those uh, those models on your local machine. Okay, and then you know I just stopped it because you know it will go it will go for uh, for four hours literally. Okay, and and it does improve it does improve results right. But then again, uh, you know uh, bagging, stacking, etc. Uh, that takes time to train, and of course prediction time will be will be uh, longer because. You know, if you predict with uh, you know X model in parallel uh, and then ensemble, uh, you know it just takes longer than a single prediction. So if you if you need batch prediction, you know like I discussed uh, before, it's not a huge problem. Um, you don't really care that uh, images are predicted in, in you know 500 milliseconds instead of I don't know 50 milliseconds. Um, if if the goal is to deploy this to uh, to a real time app, then yes. Um, course prediction time does matter okay all right so in a nutshell this is really um this is really um how you how you work with auto glue on on a, on a computer vision example um so very very little code uh here i am um, th there's one more thing i like to to discuss uh, here I, I run everything in the um uh, in the notebook okay um because it's a quick demo and and it's fine it's probably what you you know what you would do as well for um, for experimentation um, get a sense of how much accuracy you could get um, it's not a huge data set but i guess i could even work with a you know fewer images maybe take 1000 images per class and, and still get okay results just enough to uh, to tempt me to tempt me to uh, launch you know those uh, those huge uh you know 12 hour jobs but generally uh, we're doing this in the notebook. Um, if you want to do this at scale, if you really want to run, you know, um, jobs that span, you know, hours and days, um, it's probably not what you want to do. So, um, so there's a there's a couple of options. Um, so one option is to run uh, your auto glue on jobs as uh, a SageMaker processing job. Okay, and I've discussed SageMaker processing to death <laughs> uh, in, in uh, over the over the episodes, um, and it's it's it works exactly as you would think. Okay, um, so here's this is this is an example from uh, from a previous episode. Uh, the, you'll find the code in the uh, in the repo. Uh, so create uh, you know a, a SageMaker processing processor and then run it etc etc okay and then the code is basically your auto glue on code um package so to speak uh with a, with a script mode as a uh, as a SageMaker processing job so it, it, this works very well here so there's just just one caveat i guess uh here i'm using uh so if you're using the scalar and processor object okay which is the one I used for this uh, tabular dataset, 
So there's just one thing to know here. Uh, here in, in this particular example from uh, episode nine, uh, I'm working with a tabular data set, so I, I can uh, happily work with um, CPU-based instances. But uh, that sklearn processor object uh, does not support GPU instances. Okay, uh, you can work with GPU instances if you use the the Spark processor. Okay, so if you write uh, your uh, PySpark script, um, and you know I haven't tried it, but uh, you know I'm pretty sure I can work uh, auto glue on into this right as as a Py, as a PySpark script. Then yes, you can you can use GPU instances, but the the I would say the the vanilla a scalar and processor doesn't doesn't support them. So for tabular data sets, um, I would recommend just running a scalar and processor objects, pick the right instance size, and then just, uh, you know, uh, like I said, uh, modify your auto glue on code to, uh, to make it work as a, as a SageMaker -like processing job. Um, if you need GPU instances, and you certainly need that for, uh, for deep learning uh, jobs, then um, the, the Spark processor is, uh, is certainly a better choice. Okay, so that's the first option. Uh, go and uh, run those jobs, automate those jobs as, uh, uh, as uh, SageMaker processing jobs, okay? Um, of course, you could, uh, you, could still run this on, uh, you could still run this on EC2, uh, absolutely, right? Uh, and, and just fire up EC2, uh, EC2 instances and, and do everything yourself. Um, or you can, with a little work, uh, you can certainly build uh, a custom container for SageMaker and uh, and just install MXNet, install AutoGluon, and just train uh, this as a, as a proper SageMaker job. And uh, and then of course you could leverage all the all the cool features that SageMaker includes, right? Uh, you know, matter spot training and, and everything else. Okay, so these are the different options that I see, you know, um, experiment in the notebook, that's fine, at small scale, run on EC2, but, you know, that's that's a bit of work to set everything uh, up. Um, you'd sage maker processing if you want to run just batch, uh, you know, batch jobs or build a container for SageMaker and um, and just uh, and just run auto glue on right uh, in there. Right, which is probably something we should have done, um, but last time I checked, Auto Glue on wasn't part of the uh, of the built-in MXNet container, so maybe later. Okay, um, so that's pretty much what I wanted to show you today. So as you can see, you know, two lines of code, bam, um, ninety percent accuracy, out of the box, no tweaking, uh, and then of course, if you decide to go and tweak, um, you know, change the learning rate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm sure you can um, uh, run HPO and so on, try different models. I'm sure you can you can vastly improve those results. Okay, so just before I forget, let me show you the the repo again. Right here it is. Okay, so you'll find the code there. So go and go and try that out. Go and grab some images that you have. As you can see, there's really no data prep required. Create your folders. Write two lines of code. Bam. Okay. So go and try that out and uh, and you know of course ping me if you if you have questions. All right. Okay, well that's the end of this uh, solo episode and uh, I hope that was okay. And uh, I'll see you next week with uh, the final episode for now and uh, in this one we will explore uh, a multimodal data set with uh, images and text uh, and and more stuff. And we'll see what we can do with other pull on. Okay? Until then, I hope you learned a few things. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.